Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Brand Design Masters podcast. I'm really stoked. I'm here today with James Mulvaney. And James is the founder of Radio.co, Podcast.co, and Matchmaker.fm. Radio.co is a complete radio station management tool. It offers a complete solution for broadcasters in an easy-to-use cloud-based package. Podcast.co, on the other hand, we'll get into the what's the difference between radio and podcasting, which I kind of want to know. Um, podcast.co offers a full service podcasting um, uh, solution, and it's a platform for hosting. And they also have an agency arm that offers end to end production services with studios in Manchester and London in the UK and also in New York City. And matchmaker.fm is like Tinder for podcasts, and it's a matchmaking platform that connects podcasters with potential guests. So, with that, I welcome James. <laughs> what an intro, Philip. Thanks for having me on. How's it going? Awesome. Awesome. Thank you for joining us. I really want, I'm excited to kind of dive into the world of podcasting with you. Yeah. Um, first of all, I want to understand uh, the difference between, you know, radio station management and podcasting. I mean, they're both digital and internet based at this point, right? So what's, yeah. what's the difference there? I think the kind of the, the easier way, ways of explaining it is one is live and one is on demand. So with a podcast, you know, you'll listen from the beginning with radio, you tune in and you'll listen to whatever show is going out right now. And um, of course, there's become more and more increasingly like a crossover between the two mediums. I think um, a lot of people think of podcasting as kind of like the new radio. Um, and a lot of people think, oh, is this the end of radio? But I think radio is still here to stay. I think radio is as popular as ever. Um, we've seen that during lockdown, especially, which we can get onto in a bit. But, you know, I think um, radio and podcasting both have kind of their own individual benefits. I think podcasting is certainly more of a widespread medium and obviously it's more accessible to, to more people. Radio is still quite a niche thing in terms of like the, the number of clients we see wanting to create radio stations. But, you know, I think that there's, there's pros and cons to both, really. So in radio is, you know, the radio stations we have now are 24 hour things, right? They have programming around the clock so are brands doing radio or when we're talking about radio is that is it not 24 hours for the people who have internet radio stations yeah i mean the the, the benefit and the beauty of radio.co and the, the reason that i kind of created it really was because you know traditionally imagine setting up a radio station is very big and expensive you need lots of djs you need lots of you know big machinery and equipment all this kind of stuff to keep everything going and really what i wanted to do was create something that allowed you to, to automate the output of a station 24 hours a day without having to invest in that infrastructure or without having to have you know a, a huge team behind it um so you know you can really broadcast live eg from your computer uh, out to the world or you can set up playlists which will then go out at specific times of the day and likewise you can also pre-record content as well so it kind of allows um station owners to create kind of a simulated live output without actually necessarily having to be there pressing play on the next song 24 hours a day got it so uh, where do people find internet radio i mean i'm i to tell you the truth i feel like i really didn't know it existed to the level that it sounds like it does yeah, I mean, I think most of our clients are either brands who are looking to do something different and are looking for a way to connect with an audience. So, for example, we have uh, music festivals, we have record labels, um, we have um, kind of world famous clubs and bars who create radio channels because obviously their, their kind of focus is around creating a music curation experience you know, when you're at that venue or when you're at that experience, but they want a way of communicating with people outside of this. Likewise, you know, we have bars and restaurants who want to create soundscapes, which roll out across multiple venues that they own, hotel chains, golf clubs, all sorts of things like that. Um, and then traditional radio stations, you'd imagine, sometimes they are kind of like a new breed of radio stations. They might be hyper-local. So for example, we have Soho Radio in London, just like you have Soho in New York City. Um, we have a very similar kind of vibe going on in Soho, London. Um, and it's, you know, it's basically showcasing what's going on in the area. And there's lots of creatives. There's lots of advertising and design professionals who are living and working in the area. There's lots of music industry um, folks living and working around the area. So it kind of is a showcase to what's going on, the kind of creative output of Soho in London. Um, and, you know, various other platforms as well. 
for example, you know, specific music stations. So um, a genre, one station we have, which is really popular, is called K-pop Way. And K-pop is something I don't know anything about, but I know it has a huge it's following. They Just see, look at Twitter. They're always <laughs> dominating the trending thing in Twitter. They see some really huge numbers and they're, they're absolutely oh, killing it. Um, but, you know, it's a specific genre. And if you want to tune into a K-pop radio station and you go to your traditional radio dial in your car or on your- Good luck. You know, yeah, good luck. So, so that's what the, the sort of filling the gap. Oh, cool. Okay. All right. So I feel like I have a much better handle on it now. Um, so let's, let's pivot. Let's pivot yep. to podcasting. So podcasting has obviously completely exploded and your business is going gangbusters. Is, you know, is it overpopulated? Is now still a good time to start a podcast if you're thinking about it? I think absolutely. I mean, the, the direct comparison which you can draw is, you know, if you look at podcasts, there's around a million podcasts at the moment. Apple announced there was a million sometime over the summer. Um, if you think about the number of active Instagram accounts or YouTube channels, there are huge, hugely greater numbers of those channels than there are podcasts. So it's still a big opportunity to, to get cut through, I think, in podcasting. But if you think about those million podcasts, there's something like, I think a third of them are really active. Mm. Um, so, you know, maybe 300,000 podcasts that are actually active, pushing out content every single month. There's tons and tons of podcasts out there where there's like 10 episodes or less. I forget the exact number, but it's you know, it's a large chunk. Um, so if you're willing to give it a go and you're willing to really be consistent and make sure that you're delivering value in all your episodes and make sure that you're, you know, sticking to a schedule and, and being realistic about doing that, um, I think it's a great opportunity still. So what kind of challenges are podcasters facing these days? I mean, obviously the consistency thing and, you know, keeping up with the volume of, you know, staying at it and getting past 10 episodes, right? Yeah. But what other kind of challenges are people seeing? I still think there's a, an issue with discoverability. Um, if you think about iTunes or Apple Podcasts, as it's now called, you know, that was designed like 15 years ago. Um, they haven't really innovated and had they haven't really changed the, the platform. It kind of looks the same as it did in 2010. So I think Google are making steps there in terms of now when you search for stuff on Google, you actually see podcast results along with your organic search listings. I think the next stage will be, you know, more AI based. So rather than just being able to search for a podcast title, like, for example, if someone types my name into, uh, you know, Spotify or Apple Podcasts, they might find this episode actually being able to then decipher what is contained within the audio and make that kind of more text searchable. I think also voice AI still kind of got a lot, long way to go. Mm. You know, if, if smart speakers are great if you know what you're looking for currently, but they're not particularly good if you're wanting to discover new stuff. So what would you say if, if there were any watch outs for people who are just starting to podcast? Mm. What, are, what are some of the things that podcasters should never do or should really try to avoid? Well, I think firstly, um, have a good plan in, in place, you know, think about who your audience is and why you want to reach them. Um, certainly a few years ago, there was like this trend of just people like, Oh, I'm going to just record a podcast with my friends and get, you know, we'll just, uh, get some beers in and re start recording and see what happens. You know, I <laughs> kind think of what um, I do kind of <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> but like, um, you know, I think you can have fun with it. Sure. But I think it, certainly if you're thinking about doing it to promote your brand or from a business perspective, you really need to be crystal clear on who your audience is. And I'm sure, you know, like you teach this stuff all the time. It's like actually understanding the demographic, I think is crucial. Um, and then making sure that you're actually giving them what they want. You know, don't just sort of assume that you kind of know everything and you want to just create content based on what you think, actually engaging with your audience and, and seeing what kind of comments that they're saying or, um, you know, trying to encourage some form of discussion between you and them, I think is really important. Um, and again, we see a lot of businesses who just don't seem to bother doing that. That's a, that's a really great point. I'm glad, glad you brought that up because I think that, you know, this more natural networking in terms of really um, developing that, the back and forth of the yeah. conversation with your audience, when you're podcasting, you know, people can leave a comment. Yes. But what are some of the other ways that you can actually make it feel when you're delivering a podcast that there's a conversation happening or that you're getting feedback or engaging with your audience? I think, um, you know, shouting people out, you know, encouraging the discussion. So one thing we see a lot of podcasters doing this works well for a couple of reasons. Um, it's just basically have a custom email address. So you might have like, you know, join the club at 
whatever your podcast is called dot com. And, you know, if people email that address, they can perhaps get access to some bonus content. So you're encouraging people to engage with you, but then also just encourage people to be able to communicate with you, you know, have an email address that, you know, people can actually reach out. They're not getting through to some kind of robot. They're not going through to sort of like a, a black hole or whatever. They're actually getting through to you and they can, you know, ask questions and then, be, you know, have the have have a question and answer section, you know, ask mm-hmm. me anything type stuff works really well. Um when you're actually starting to mention people in your content, I think it helps to kind of create that bond between you and your audience. They'll be better advocates for you as well, because if you shout them out or if you answer their problems, you get a you super fan. Yeah, absolutely. It's just about creating that kind of momentum. Um, and of course it takes work and it takes time. It doesn't happen overnight, you know? That's absolutely true. And because of that amount of work that you have to put into it, and we know content marketing is a long game. Um, mm. How, you know, Yes, being on the airwaves is great and developing an audience is great, but then sometimes eventually you want it to pay back, right? So I know you po- posted a, a video recently about how to monetize a podcast and you mm-hmm. mentioned kind of four different ways. Um, what are some of the ways that you can monetize a podcast? Yeah, absolutely. So I think a lot of people begin to think, oh, I need to get adverts in, you know, and I have like the 30 second spot ads at the beginning and middle and the end. And yeah, of course you can do that. Um, the ad networks aren't great in terms of the CPM isn't isn't particularly high. Um, so there are other alternative ways to monetize. Uh, the first being affiliate marketing, selling other people's products. Uh, the second being um, selling merchandise. You can also consider having um, subscriptions or a paywall, you know, so perhaps offering bonus content. Um, or or add free content to to people that works great, um, and then also the traditional sponsorship route. But try and find a sponsor if you're going down that route who's really really relevant to your audience. And if you can prove that your audience is you know super fo- focused, uh, particularly you know if you've got a, a niche or whatever, and just making sure that you're creating a good match between who your audience is and that sponsor. So there's a lot of there's a lot of similarity in and show formats, right? I mean, it seems to be only a few, right? Kind of the solo shows where people are just talking or interview shows. Um, how can people, you know, you obviously are in a great position to come across and experience and really understand deeply a whole lot of different types of podcasts because of mm-hmm. the business you're in where podcast.co. Um, but so are there any ways that you would recommend that people you know, look at or pay attention to in order to differentiate themselves in the podcasting space? It's a good question. I think, um, you know, having, you know, being able to sort of say, split your show, if you want to create sort of 30 minutes worth of content, you know, one thing you could do is just split that into three different segments. So you can have a 10 minute interview, you can maybe have 10 minute Q&A, and then 10 minutes updating your audience on something that you've just learned or whatever it might be. Um, So, you know, that's kind of an easy way. If, If you're thinking about starting a podcast, and perhaps, you know, you want it to sort of stand out, just think about trying to sp- splitting it into different segments, because that's traditionally what we do in radio, right? You know, if you listen to a radio show, it's not just one form of content. They might have music for a section. They might have a caller on the line. They might then have an interview with a celebrity or someone else. Um, so just think, sort of thinking about the different types of content and sort of merging them together in one show. You know, that's one way of approaching it. Another way is just building a narrative, you know, between episodes and um, allowing people to kind of have that thirst for more information. So rather than kind of giving everything to to someone in one episode, you know, think about how you can spread that story over several episodes throughout the series. I love that. And, you know, you look at podcasts like Serial, right, that Mm. have been incredibly successful in kind of serializing a, a story. Um, that's brilliant. And I, to be honest with you, that's amazing, James, because I have never heard of that kind of treating a podcast like a segmented show. Mm. And I've, I've listened to a lot of podcasts and I don't know that I've ever heard anyone do it that way. And as you were describing it, I kept kind of going back to thinking about how I organize my newsletter, Brand Muse, which is, you know, I start off with a little bit of a, a blog thought bubble and then some resources and some recommended videos and quotes. And I think that that's a really, really interesting way to, um, to create some interest across your podcast, each episode of your podcast mm. too. Yeah. And of course you might find that some listeners will just like really resonate better with one segment versus right. another. So, you know, there, there have been, you know, it's just like with a lot of YouTube videos, sometimes you'll actually end up skipping through them and watching parts of them, and rewinding, etc. People treat podcasts in exactly the same way. They're not always necessarily going to be listening 
you know, from zero, 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 zero to like the end of the episode, um, they might, if they know that there's a certain format and they know at 10 minutes in, there'll be some, an interview or 20 minutes in, there'll be Q and A or whatever, they might then skip around. Um, but it's about, you know, making sure that that format's clear and, and make sure that you put that in the show notes if you're sort of starting a new format um, to make it clear from the get-go just as you would on, on YouTube comments uh, or YouTube description, rather, you know, actually make sure that, you, you know, you're giving your audience as much information about the episode as possible rather than just saying, you know, something very brief. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, why not just treat it like a radio show? So think of it like a, think of it like that. And, and actually it's also a way to experiment with what is the stickiest part of your show too. Mm -hmm. I mean, like in my newsletter, I discovered very early on that my resources section where I basically link to software as a service or actually, you know, apps or mm -hmm. things that I you know, found interesting to, to creative professionals proved to be an incredibly popular section of my newsletter. And it started off kind of as an afterthought. Yeah. And now it is a very important part of my newsletter. And so it's a way to kind of like, instead of doing an entire episode about one thing, you can kind of, and then have to do that episode after episode, you can basically kind of do a little kind of test, right? Yeah, absolutely. Play around with different ideas. Again, I think people sort of think, oh, I've got to commit to doing the same podcast forever and ever and ever. Right, right. Uh, you know, if you think about a podcast in seasons, like you would a TV show or a Netflix series, um, you know, treat your podcast like that, have a, a six or eight part or 10 part season, have a little break. You can always come back to it later in the year or the following year and then revise what you're doing and reiterate. You know, I think a lot of people, again, think, oh, you need to get this perfect from day one. They record one episode. They don't get million listeners to that first episode. Yeah. There's my audience. Uh, of course, it doesn't work like that. You know, you're going to have to stick at it for a while. But I think you become better at things over time. It's just like anything. The more practice you have, you know, the better you become. Um, but there's no reason you can't reiterate your format and sort of adapt it. Absolutely. And, you know, I've, I've done the same thing on YouTube and you're doing the same thing on YouTube, right? Yeah. You're doing solo shows, you're doing kind of product reviews, you're doing mm -hmm. interviews, you're, you're kind of spanning the gamut of what's possible on YouTube. And, you know, it's sometimes you find that one kind of video of yours is much more popular than the other. And then you learn to leverage that to a greater extent to grow your audience. Yeah, completely. And just do do more of what's working and, and less of what doesn't work, you know. So something that I also was um, looking at on some of your videos was the difference between you had some videos on podcasts for brands and yeah. then also podcasts for personal brands. Mm. Talk about the differences between those two things and this, maybe some of the challenges that brands are having when it comes to trying to get on the, you know, the get in your earbuds to, uh, to be a brand. Yeah, I mean, I think brands, um, you know, people resonate with people, don't they? Um, so ultimately, like podcasting is quite a personal thing for lots of people. So it's, you know, it's you, you have that experience where you feel like you're almost sat there with the person having that conversation, or you're almost in the same room, if it's like an interview style thing like this. Whereas if you're a brand, you know, you can kind of leverage that still. Um, but if you kind of just have like a corporate podcast, um, it's not always going to resonate with people in the same way as, you know, having sort of a named person who's heading that podcast up. So with a lot of the corporate clients that we work with, we generally recommend that, you know, they have someone who's at least leading the podcast. It might be that it varies from episode to episode. They might have different, you know, staff members or different customers participating, but ultimately they have like that solid anchor who sat there, you know, leading each episode. And I think that's quite important. Um, you know, also uh, personal branding's taking off and it's become this kind of big buzzword over the past few years. Um, I think personal branding is, is a fantastic tool and a great link to, to podcasting. You know, if you're creating a brand for you um, and, and you not naturally customers will be drawn to you, um, you know, then can alternatively feed back into the business. So it's kind of like a kind of nice cycle you're creating there. So let's pivot a little bit and talk about your business. So you have three different companies and yeah. you're also building a personal brand. And so tell Talk a little bit about what was the evolution? What company came first? Was there a progression that was logical or intentional? Or was it kind of like you just built one, it was successful and you got it running by itself and you ran off to something new? What came first? So radio was first. I was, my, my kind of story, you know, to sort of summarize it briefly, I wanted to go into radio as an on-air personality when I was really young, when I was like 16, 17. 
decided that you know it was quite a tough industry to break and at the same time I was sort of learning how to build websites I was a bit of a nerd you know learning how to write code and stuff and I kind of just fused the two together so I ended up creating a brand called wave streaming which um, ran whilst I went to university did pretty well I kind of graduated and then you know I was lucky I had a business I could start recruiting uh, team members um, and from that kind of radio.co was almost like an evolution of that business so we kind of we wanted to create a platform which was more user friendly. We wanted to create something that was a bit more kind of like prosumer focused versus like B2B. So with wave streaming, we were selling to very traditional, what you'd imagine to be radio stations. But we noticed there was more and more clients who were coming to us who weren't brands, but they might be, you know, um, uh, sorry, they weren't radio stations, but that might be brands who are, have music focus. So for example, I mentioned earlier, like bars and restaurants music festivals, record labels. And there was always someone in the marketing team who had kind of come up with this idea of, oh, let's start a radio station. And they were coming to us asking for advice on how to do that. So we wanted to create a platform which was really accessible and, and simple to use. And that's really how the idea for radio.co came about. And um, from that, podcast.co came around. Uh, we launched podcast.co in 2019. And Matchmaker has, has a new product which we bought to market in February this year. So, so matchmaker is really interesting. And, you know, I've in developing this podcast and my YouTube channel, I've started to get more and more pitches from people who want to be on the show. Mm. And, you know, it's very interesting to be gauging the professionalism of those pitches. Yeah. And also, you know, a lot of people are using PR agencies or agents to do their pitching for them now. And so talk a little bit about matchmaker. How, how is that going? And what's the response been? Yeah, it's been really good. I've, it's a it's a product unlike I've ever launched before. So we've you know I've always been software as a service basically, and um, you know that's my experience creating you know solutions using software and, and servers and technology. Whereas this is like creating connections between people. So it's really different to anything I've ever launched. Um, we've grown. We launched in February this year, 2020. Um, we've grown. It's now October, so we've grown in eight months to like twelve thousand users. Wow. Um, which is which is incredible. We've had huge response rate, and and people are getting lots of value from it, which is awesome. Um, the idea for Matchmaker was really came around because we were when we launched Podcast.co last year, we we were looking at different funnels and marketing tools that we could create, and we kind of came up with the idea of oh, there's got to be lots of people looking for guests for their podcast, and likewise, there's got to be lots of podcasters who are looking for guests. So we created some landing pages. And a bit of content around this in our strategy um and really we just saw these as funnels we thought these people will make good customers for podcast.co and of course some of them have which is great but then we realized well we've got these big lists of guests and we've got this big list of podcasters we have no way of actually connecting them together so we thought wouldn't it be great if we could create a tool which does that so we sat down with our designer in summer of last year and we kind of created this kind of idea for like tinder for podcasters and uh, we, we kind of created some UI designs, basically like wireframes. And, um, you know, later in the year, it decided we decided to actually crack on and, and build the thing and see what happened. And, and we kind of launched it in February, like as an MVP. And yeah, it's, it's really been a big eye opener because this thing has just grown so quickly. Um, we've just switched on monetization. We're moving to a freemium model now. Mm -hmm. um but yeah there's there's lots of promise and i and i think one of the things that i've learned with it is as well is that there's so much more we can add so initially we thought oh let's just connect podcasters and um guests but we're now thinking well we could connect podcasters with brands who are looking to advertise we could maybe open up to more influencer types versus just podcasters and there's kind of lots of different directions uh, and different avenues of opportunity that we can explore so in that one of the things that you know i am able to see when people pitch themselves to be on the podcast mm. is the quality of their media kit, right? Mm. So a lot of people, some people send a PDF that's got great pictures and a bio and conversation starters and things like that. Other people mm. are just like banging out an email and saying, Hey, I see you have a podcast. So do you have anything in terms of people developing, you know, a profile on matchmaker where they're essentially doing an online media kit that people can peruse and kind of judge their guests by? Yeah, that's exactly it. The idea, um, Philip, is that, you know, you have a profile as a guest, um, which you can complete with information such as links to other podcasts that you've been on. You can obviously fill it out with a kind of a tagline or a headline and then a description so you can tell people about yourself, link off to various different websites, 
Um, so the idea is really it's a profile which kind of gives a snapshot of your expertise. And I think, you know, you mentioned there, it's quite interesting to see the difference of people who have got um, good media kits. And do you find that you're naturally drawn to, towards those kind of people as a designer, I guess? Well, I do just because I think that it shows a level of professionalism. Yeah. yeah. Um, and yeah, yeah. And it's transportable, right? Instead of yeah. having to like copy the email and put it in a folder, it's like you got a PDF, you can just save it and you've got it ready when you have the guest on, you know, it's really, it's really super helpful. Um, let's, let's talk a little bit about how you, you know, you're a content producer too, right? So you've got three businesses and you're a content producer. How do you balance the needs of, you know, doing your content and promoting yourself, doing your marketing um, mm -hmm. with the needs of your businesses? I think it's about making sure that you've got a team in place to begin with. You know, there's only so much, there's only so many hours in my day to create content and I couldn't single-handedly produce the content for three different businesses and my own personal brand, you know, and edit it all, etc. So, you know, when I have, when I'm producing content for my channel, yeah, I record it, but I generally don't edit it. I don't have much involvement in the actual um, social media asset creation or the content pushing on the different channels. So um, it's about making sure that you've got those processes in place. Um, again, with the businesses, you know, in the early days of radio.co, I was very much forefront of, of any kind of content we were creating over time. Again, I sort of took myself away from being in front of the camera um, and, and made sure that we had sort of a strategy in place so that other team members could step in and present videos and create content for the brand. Um, again, when we launch a product, nowadays you know content marketing is so important you know i made the mistake with radio.co of when we launched in 2015 we had a landing page which was just like give us your email address and that was it and um, when we launched podcast.co whilst we were building the platform we spent a whole year creating content for a website which didn't have anything to sell so rather than just saying you know here's a blank page with an email capture form in we actually had a website up which didn't have anything to sell it was just it was just valuable content about podcasting that we were pushing out for a whole year before actually launching the platform. So, you know, it's, it's kind of baked into any business that we do now. Yeah. So you've also now branched out to YouTube. So you're doing mm -hmm. video now and you, you know, you've been an audio guy forever, right? And so now you've kind of gone into video to why, why did you do that? Number one, and mm -hmm. what have your challenges been in kind of making that jump over to YouTube? Well, I mean, we've always had YouTube channels for the businesses. Um, okay. I've started focusing on creating more content as me as well as having the, the two YouTube channels for podcast and radio. Um, I think the reason of doing for doing it was because I wanted to grow my personal brand. I think there's um, a lot of my content is ultimately still going to be focused around either podcasting, radio, and also I'm sort of experimenting with different areas, kind of like we we talked about before. Um, when when I sort of chatted to you for my channel, we were talking about you know how how you uh, have sort of um, created content initially for branding, but then you've sort of moved over to the sort of entrepreneurial world. So you know, I think again, it's just about finding that balance between different types of content for different markets and creating stuff that's going to ultimately attract potentially new customers to your businesses. Um, so sometimes if you create content that's just so obvious, it's like okay we create content for radio station owners or for podcasters. Um, yeah, that's great. But then if I start creating content for people who are looking for information on personal branding, potentially I can tell them about matchmaker or I can tell them about podcast.co. Um, and so it just seemed at sort of at the end of last year, I was like, right, I'm going to start, I'm going to spend a year working on my personal brand, which I'd never done before. And, and just, and to see how we, we get on. And it's great because um, we've managed to grow the channel to, nearly 5,000 um, subscribers, um, which is which is good, awesome. And, you know, pushing out lots of content. And ultimately, the, any content I create, I make sure that we've got a funnel to take that traffic back to either podcast.co or radio.co. I think that's quite important. So you've got, you have three businesses mm -hmm. and you have brand customers, you have individual, you know, personal mm -hmm. brand customers, you have, um, you know, um, hobbyist customers so i mean you're you're if you're in the content you're developing for youtube you're serving a lot of masters basically mm -hmm. i mean the and so how do you um how do you segment your content to address because this is what we were talking about on on my interview on your show was yeah. that how do you address balancing that um you know the content creator uh, 
avatar with the brand avatar. And mm. then, then you, again, you're balancing, you know, kind of video and radio and podcasting and, mm. you know, guest management and all those aspects of your business. You have a lot of things to talk about. Yeah. And I think, again, it's um, some of it's trial and error. You know, sometimes we'll, we'll sit down at the start of every month. We'll say, right, what's, what topics do we want to create content for this month? And it might be that we're, we're having a push um, on, on one on brand or the other. So, for example, um, currently on my YouTube channel, I've been creating content focused around hardware. So looking at devices to review like audio interfaces and microphones. Um, sometimes I'll have a push for a month where I'll just focus on creating podcasting related content. Again, sometimes it'll be like, right, let's create radio content, but talk about theory. So rather than talking about gizmos and gadgets, we're talking about, you know, how to uh, be a good presenter or how to mm. write a script for your radio show. And really the way I, I create content is, is driven by what the, 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 uh, my conversations with the different teams who are working on each platform. Uh, and also just to some extent, you know, it's been, a, it's been the first year of doing it. So as I said, it has it's been a bit of trial and error. We're pushing out content. Some seems to work better than others. Um, but you know, we're, we're kind of making sure that we're kind of consistent We're EG, we're pushing out a video every single week. So what's, what's been working, what's been working for you? I think the video that's, uh, one of the videos that's worked really well, interestingly, I created two videos. So I created how to monetize a radio station. I think we're mm. up to 10,000 views and no, actually it might be more, it might be like 14 now. Uh, and that's been over like two months. And I created a video on how to monetize your podcast. Hasn't done well at all. You know, it's mm. only, um, I think it's less than a thousand views. So, you know, again, it, they slowly creep up, but you'll see that some just kind of explode really quickly in terms of the view count and others just kind of like have this steady incline, but it's nothing exciting. So again, you know, your guess is as good as mine as to why, but I think one of the things I've learned is with YouTube, it seems, again, this is kind of my theory. Uh, I don't know if this is true, but it seems that if you kind of hit that, get that momentum within the first 24 hours, like if you can get sort of a thousand views on a video within 24 hours, it seems to climb pretty well. You know, I think the algorithm thinks, oh, this is obviously quite important. People are engaging with this. Whereas if you don't get those views and or people are switching off, you know, the, the content sort of seems to kind of flatline. Yeah, that's true. Uh, the 24 hours is really important, which is why when you launch a video, mm. you know, blanketing all of your other social media with promotions of it is important. And then I've also found and heard that responding to comments in the video mm. are all, is also really important because it's showing that you're paying it, you as the creator are paying attention to your audience and really engaging. Yeah. Um, so that's what you've been, you know, you've seen some success with those things. What, what have been the challenges on in doing YouTube for you? Well, I think, you know, just committing to, uh, you know, along with running different businesses, just committing to actually recording an episode every single yeah. week, be difficult. And then obviously trying to come up with concept, you know, the concept for each episode and, and create content. I tend to have to block off about half a day a week to, to record it. Um, some seem to go really well and others I'll have to do like 10 takes before I'm happy, you know? Oh, yeah. um, and, and of course it's a challenge. And, you know, I've been, I do a week, I've just finished a series of weekly live streams called working lunch, which I've been doing for the past three months. So again, you know, that's, that's something else, but it's, I think ultimately, um, you know, content is always just going to be a challenge. You need to make sure that you've constantly got new ideas um, and you're responding. Ultimately, you mentioned about replying to comments the comments have been a great source of, of ideas as well. Cause you, people will ask questions and you think, actually I can do a completely separate video about Oh, that. absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I get a lot of ideas for videos yeah. from comments um, and I, I'll ask people right in the video. I'll say, Hey, you got an idea for a video. You got a question or something you'd like me to expand on. Just let me know in the comments. And I, I get all sorts of ideas for video content. So I, I love the idea of uh, number one, working lunch is a killer live stream title. I, I admire that. That was a great branding exercise, you know, coup on your part. So you're doing lives too. And I've yeah. been going live increasingly more often and I find it incredibly fun and really engaging for the audience. Mm. So tell me about working lunch. What is that format like and what do you do? So, you know, again, this was a, a, a thing which we decided to do at the start of the year. I'd applied for LinkedIn live because they obviously had it. They have it. In, I think it's still in beta. I think yeah, you start to yeah. apply for it. Um, and I saw some, some people streaming on LinkedIn and getting some really good audience numbers. So I thought, okay, I'm going to apply for this. I had to wait three or four months before I got the approval. And one day I got it through and I thought, do you know what? I haven't even thought about what format I could do. <laughs> so I needed to come up with something. So the, the idea of working lunch is a simple premise. 
it's kind of business focused content. So sometimes I'll speak to podcasting or radio types, and sometimes I'll speak to more marketing people uh, and business people. And I will ask them to bring to the table three strategies, um, really their area of expertise. And I just have an, a conversation with them about it. And it normally goes for like 30 to 45 minutes, do a live Q and A at the end. Again, it's fantastic for audience engagement. And um, one of the things I have noticed with LinkedIn, which is a great shame is the numbers have slowly declined, you know, like, I think maybe at the start of the year, they were really pushing these live streams. Mm. So like every one of your contacts would get a push notification saying James is live. It doesn't seem to happen now. Or maybe people have just got so sick of seeing these things that they just don't click on them anymore. But, mm. um, you know, but, it, but it's been fantastic and it's been a great way of just meeting loads of different people uh, and learning lots of stuff, you know, as an entrepreneur, like interviewing people who are running other businesses or who are experts at the top of their game and just sort of drawing on their expertise, you know, on, on each, each week, we have a different sort of era of discussion almost. Um, but yeah, it's been great. So it's an interview format. Do you take, yep. I mean, and it's live. So there are, depending on the format, I'm not that familiar with LinkedIn live, but is there, can you take chat questions or yeah. is there any, there is. And mm -hmm. do you engage with the audience at, at all when you do working lunch? Yeah, absolutely. So we do a Q&A. Um, so we, okay. we, we have three three topics to discuss. We talk for about 10 minutes on each one. They're all, you know, there's the same kind of theme. Um, and then it's a sort of a 10, 15 minute Q and A at the end. Um, so we will take questions. Normally the questions are for the guest rather than for me, um, but people will ask questions and we answer them. So let's talk a little bit about your own journey. So, you know, you've been very successful. You started off very early. I mean, you had a, a business in college and that is still going and that's pretty amazing. Um, mm -hmm. So what kind of difficulties have you had to overcome? It's a good question. I mean, I've, um, I think the, the first major hurdle I had in business was actually just kind of getting it to a level where, you know, it was generating enough income so I could start kind of expanding. Mm. You know, I, I launched it in college, it made me a living, um, but it took probably five or six years for me to really sort of start getting that momentum. Once I was at that level, I uh, was lucky. I managed to, to strike a deal with um, AOL. Um, and I was like 22, 23 years old. I went, flew to New York, had a meeting with AOL. They were like, we want to work with you. We've got this product, which was kind of, um, it was, it was a bit of software called Shoutcast. Some people might remember watching this a software called Winamp, which was like a Windows. Oh meeting. yeah. Oh yeah. man. Yeah. And, uh, so, so this was part of Winamp, part of the Winamp suite almost And AOL acquired Winamp in 99, I think but they hadn't done anything with it for like 10 years. So they kind of took us on board to work with them as a partner um, because we'd created some software, which was sort of innovating around this live streaming part of, of Winamp. Um, so I was like phenomenal. So they were referring us loads and loads of business. I was like, this is not going to last forever. Um, so it kind of, it, it, you know, the business went from, from there to there sort of overnight almost. And, uh, you know, but it was, it was, we were relying on this third party almost. So we were sort of re relying on the traffic that they were sending us, the leads mm. that they were sending us to convert. And one day they, they decided to sell this business to someone else who weren't keen to work with us. So straight away that, uh, that sort of suddenly just went away overnight. Wow. Now I was like, okay, uh, I was probably about 24 at the time. And that really had a big impact on me. I spent a year sort of scratching my head thinking, oh God, everything I've worked for is going to kind of come caving in around me. And of course that didn't happen, but um, it was still a bit of a wake up call because I was kind mm. of very much just reliant on this sort of this one source of leads. So at that stage, you know, that was kind of the, the catalyst, which caused the, the idea for radio.co to come around. And I think, you know, it, it kind of, it taught me to approach business in a little bit of a different way where, you know, we needed to be responsible for our own destiny versus relying on like one big party. Um, so, so that was kind of a, that was a bit of an eye opener and that was a lot, I learned a lot of lessons in that whole process, to be honest. I learned about working with a huge corporation. Sure. Um, I learned about, you know, suddenly having to scale things really quickly because we were, we were struggling like as a, as a sort of small team to actually scale the product, um, you know, and, and also just learned about business, like how to, we were suddenly getting all this traffic. How do we convert them into customers? So it was a really, really good learning uh, curve that. Very early on in your career too. So yeah, yeah. it's those, it's those, um, those painful stumbles that teach us the deepest lessons that I think last the longest with us. Mm. So, 
I think so. Yeah. And, and one of the things as well was just that, you know, I didn't see it coming. It kind of happened very quickly. It happened overnight for me. Uh, and I sort of went from, you know, having almost been like a one man business to suddenly having like a team of, I think about 10 pretty much within the space of a year. Wow. Uh, so again, I, I, I kind of learned how to manage staff and, and, and all sorts of things, but yeah, it was a sort of probably a, an intense two, three years of, you know, sort of a real life business experience. And before that, I was probably just sat in my kind of dorm room at college, you know, just sort of, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, this is fun, you know, so it's kind of a bit of a, a wake Lark. up. Yeah. Yeah. So we've all had people who've inspired us or influenced us or mentored us through our careers. Have you had anybody like that who was an inspiration to you or someone you looked up to or influenced you directly? I mean, I think, to be honest with you, it was a case of, you know, I used to look at uh, Steve Jobs and Mark Zuckerberg and and these kind of folks. And um, I, I, I don't think there's been, it's quite hard. People ask me this question all the time. I don't think there's like one person that I think oh, these persons really influenced me. Um, and again, I don't really follow celebrities much or I don't have kind of like, I don't know, idols that I, that I sort of follow. But um, I think really just from an early age, it was um, just keeping an eye on what was going on online, just having your eyes open and, um, and sort of being reactive to opportunities. I'm, I'm a big believer that, you know, you can set yourself up so you can kind of create your own luck so if you're in the right position right place right time you know and and lady luck comes knocking on your door you can be uh, well equipped to sort of take advantage of it so how do you continue to grow how do you continue to to inspire yourself where do you get your fuel i wish i knew the answer to that (laughs) i don't know i think um I think sometimes as an entrepreneur, I have to calm it down actually, because there's, mm. I have so many ideas all the time. And I used to be really guilty for this, maybe like 10 years ago, you know, I'd, I'd literally be registering domain names every week with different business yeah. ideas that I had. And sometimes I'd start working on a product or a platform and I end up not finishing it. So I actually think there's inspiration all around us. I think, you know, you, you could just, you have to listen to your customers for one. Um, and look at what they're asking for you know that's how matchmaker really came around um, but you know you've got to be as an entrepreneur a good judge of when to actually take action on something and, and do something about it and, and just think actually maybe that idea is one for another day because otherwise you can kind of get too caught up and, and sort of trying to conquer the world and do everything yeah prioritizing when you have a lot of ideas as an entrepreneur is one of the hardest things to do to really know what you need to shelf shelving things is i find the hardest thing to do yeah can be yeah um but then again you know as uh as well as an entrepreneur now i have a different approach to things i'm not trying to do as much myself so Mm. if i want to execute a new idea it's a lot more expensive to do so because i'm not like trying to build it myself i'm not writing the code anymore i'd have to like look at hiring or devoting some resource to that um likewise with marketing it and sort of and, and taking you know making sure we get it off the ground so you know i think that's probably helped me calm down a bit but i don't have like an infinite amount of resource yeah yeah so you mentioned this is one of the things i noticed when i first met you was yeah. your urls and you just mentioned purchasing urls and oh, i yeah. want you to tell a story because i mean you look at radio.co yeah podcast.co i was like how in hell did james get these urls like they must have cost a million dollars because urls like that do cost a million dollars now so like tell the story of how you nailed those things down sure i mean it's a good story and you know i've never told this in a podcast so i don't know if Uh, i want to discuss exact exact figures but um i don't know know, it's it's like so in 2013 i was looking at different domains I can't even really remember how, like the .co domain, that's actually like Columbia. And I think in 2010, Google basically said, oh, we're not going to treat it as a country specific domain. So all of a sudden there was lots of startups because obviously .coms are all taken. They're hugely expensive. Lots of startups were springing up with .co domains. But of course there was a bit of a land rush for people who bought these .co domains with like one words. So I didn't buy it for, for $20 a year or whatever. I did have to buy it like through, um, through the guy that, that obviously kind of was squatting on it. Yes. But I just saw an opportunity. I knew we obviously had a big radio audience and it's just like, it was just short and snappy. So it was like the, one of the first big investments I ever made. Um, you know, it was, it was five figure amount. And, you know, for some 2013, I'd have been like 26 or 27, something That's like that. That's a lot. Five figures for a 26 yeah. year old is and, a lot. Uh, 
That's yeah, a gulp, that's a gulp moment. <laughs> it was, and and I, you know, when I bought it, I didn't know exactly what I was going to do with it, but it just felt right. And I was like, this is, you know, that was the stage. I just got this deal with AOL, so business had taken off, so I had some money in the bank, and I was like, this is going to be a good investment. Um, and yeah, it, it, it that's how that's how that came around. And then, of course, with podcast.co, it kind of just felt like that was the natural progression. It was like, I think my OCD would be like, oh, if I called it something completely different, it would feel weird. So, yeah. so Well, you um, can just call that your 401k now, your retirement plan or those two URLs. You can just sell those and just like move to your island in the Bahamas. Yeah. But what I have, what I, what I do think is, you know, investing in brand is important, you know, and, and yeah. creating a good brand that's memorable and that's kind of, you know, easy to, 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 to sort of get your head around is, is useful. For, for customers and you. So let's let's talk about the future. Yeah. So what do you see on the future horizon for yourself? What um what are you planning? Well, I mean, um, you know, I'm con- gonna continue doing what I do for the foreseeable future. You no, know, I absolutely love what I do. Um, you know, each day presents its own challenges. As an entrepreneur, I've got quite a diverse portfolio now. So I have a few properties, not loads. I've got some property, um, I've got a few other investments. So it's kind of oh, property, property, like real estate. Yeah. 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 yeah okay. So, so, so I have a few flats that I rent out uh, or apartments and uh, you know, it's um, that, that's kind of, that's one of the things that I've, I've been sort of focusing on a, a little bit over the past few years. Again, it doesn't take up a lot of my time, but um, there's something that I was really not interested in five years ago, but it seemed like a couple of years ago, so it might be a sensible investment. Um focusing on um just obviously on the businesses and continuing to grow them you know we've just got two relatively young businesses now so um, matchmaker and podcast.co that uh, you know podcast.co is only a year old so we've still got a lot of work ahead of us there um with radio.co it's continuing to go from strength to strength um interestingly we you know i mentioned at the beginning we've had a huge spike in both customers and also in, in listeners um for for radio during lockdown, I think because it's such a personal medium, people like to know that there's someone on the other end of the the wire, so to speak. That's probably why it's so popular. Um, so it's continued to go to strength to strength. So we've got some new, we're, we're currently working on sort of a, a, a new addition to the platform, which will hopefully launch next year, um, you know, and continue to sort of grow and innovate. That's awesome. That's really exciting. And so that leads me to what you know, what, what, is there anything out there that you'd love to tell people about or promote at this point? Oh, well, you know, if anyone wants to check out any of the platforms, if they sound interesting, radio.co, podcast.co, matchmaker.fm, go and check them out. And of course, uh, if you want to find out more about me, you can go to jamesm.com slash connect. That's where all my social media handles are. Awesome. So I always ask my guests one question and, and regular listeners to the podcast will know what the question is, but do you have a personal manifesto or a mantra that you try to live your life by? Yeah, I've got this. Um, these are my sort of three sassy commandments. Um, and can I, I swear that. on this podcast? Com- com- why not? I'll just bleep it. if I. I <laughs> so number one is don't fuck about. All right. Which means just kind of get your head down and get on with it. Two is always be single-minded. Think about what you want to achieve and think about your goals. Don't get too caught up in like what other people think. Don't get too caught up in what your competition are doing. You know, especially in business, you've got to just be confident in your, your own ideas. And thirdly is perseverance is key. Sometimes things don't always work out like immediately, um, but you've got to stick at them. And it kind of goes back to what I was saying before, like, about going off on too many tangents or just trying too many different business ideas. Sometimes you've got to stick, pick one thing. As soon as you see it starts to work, stick at it. That's excellent. James, that's great, great, great advice. And so um, is there, you mentioned uh, your, your, um, your URL, your website. Is there any place else that people can engage with you or that you'd like people to contact you if they're thinking about yeah, I mean, all my social, as I mentioned before, jamesm.com slash connect. That's got like a list of all my social media handles. Okay, great. Yeah. Awesome. James, pleasure having you on the show today. I really appreciate your sharing your experience and uh, and strengths and um, in podcasting and radio and content development. And glad to have you on the show and hope you'll come back and join us again in the future. Thanks very much, Philip. Great to, uh, pleasure to speak to you.